Hello, I'm Dr. Jerry Schottbach. I pastor Lighthouse Baptist Church in Santa Maria, California, and I'm your brain masseur. I'm going to read something to you from the Bible, and then we're going to talk about Assembly Bill 2943, California Assembly Bill 2943. The Bible says that there are those who are rebuked by the Lord from the Scripture who seek to make a man an offender for a word, who lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate, and turn aside the just for a thing of naught. And that's what's happening in our state right now. They are passing laws that will effectively make a man an offender, a trespasser, a lawbreaker, for a word. Laws that literally set up a snare to trap those of us who come to the gate in our community and speak the reproof of God's word upon the conscience of our neighbors. They want to set up a a law that literally is a snare that will catch us and trap us. And we're going way back to the early days of the colonial period where they would throw pastors into prison because they were preaching without a license from the government or a license from this or that denomination. We're getting back to that kind of thing where they're controlling speech and God help us. And, and that's part of what this bill is about. At least it's part of the reason I'm concerned about this bill, AB 2943. Well, we're happy that this bill is not one of those really important bills, you know, the kind that have to be passed before we can read them. (laughs) At least in this case, we get to read the bill before they pass it. This one is titled, quote, Unlawful Business Practices, Sexual Orientation Change Efforts, end quote. So that tells you what the bill is about or what they're trying to do with the bill. And this elaborates on what their objective is, what they're trying to achieve, what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, In the Legislative Digest, where they kind of summarize the bill, the point of the bill, its purpose, and so on, its intent, uh, we read this, quote, Existing law prohibits mental health providers, as defined, from performing sexual orientation change efforts, as specified, with a patient under 18 years of age. Existing law requires a violation of this provision to be considered unprofessional conduct and subjects the provider to discipline by the provider's licensing uh, entity. And then it goes on to say, this bill would include as an an unlawful practice prohibited under the Consumer Legal Remedies Act, advertising, offering to engage in, or engaging in sexual orientation change efforts with an individual. You need to understand that it's advertising, comma, separate thing, next thing is this, offering to engage in, comma, next thing, and also this, even engaging in sexual orientation change efforts with an individual. Hmm. I hope you're listening. This bill would also declare the intent of the legislator in this regard, end quote. Okay, my friends, listen. It would be tedious and, frankly, boring if I were to simply read through the bill and offer commentary as I go along. Now, that is available to you. If you want my commentary, full commentary, I'm going to give you some selected elements of the commentary. But if you want my full commentary, on this particular bill, you can go to our website, brainmassage.net, and you can ask for it by sending me an email and mentioning uh, commentary on AB 2943. And we'll send it to you. There is a charge for that. I think it's five, maybe it's ten dollars, it's something like that. A huge amount of work goes into preparing those things, and, and those things are available to our subscribers only. You understand? Okay? But you're getting enough in this video to really know what you need to know to take the action that needs to be taken. So don't worry about that. But if you want to do what I'm doing, if you want to get a little deeper in this, then you can write and we'll we'll send that to you. Um, So it's not necessary, but it could be helpful. Here we go. My first observation. Understand that this is not about kidnapping some poor homosexual man or woman and hauling them off under a hood somewhere and chaining them to a chair, and forcing reparative uh, therapy down their throat. No, that's not at all what this bill is about. (laughs) You know, uh, as California liberals really like uh, Oh Kim Jong-un over there, you know, uh, he he does that kind of stuff. He's the guy that has these re-education camps for his people. All right. That's a that's a liberally inclined kind of thing to do. That's not something that conservatives are really into at all. <laughs> or or over there in China, 
Yeah, I understand they like to do that kind of re-education stuff over there in China. So this idea of compelling somebody uh, against their will, coercing them uh, into uh, enduring somebody, trying to talk them out of their sexual orientation, that is not what this bill is about. And as a matter of fact, I would be as opposed to that as any sane, reasonable, freedom-loving person would be. That's not what we're talking about. It's about people, homosexuals, who want to get out of that lifestyle. And they want somebody to give them some help to find a way, a path out of that lifestyle. And it's about the people who want to help their homosexual friends and colleagues, neighbors, family, and so on, who will make themselves available to help a homosexual man or woman find that path that leads to freedom from that obsessive and, frankly, very life-destroying lifestyle. However, my friends, the great concern here is that this law, as it is written, can, and we think, believe it is intended to, be applied to ministers of the gospel who write little tracts like mine, Unabridged Gospel booklet that we distribute, in which I declare very clearly that homosexuality is a sin, along with fornication, adultery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, wrath, all these different things. Homosexuality is, according to the Bible, a sin. It's a behavior that God condemns. And um, Almighty God commands all sinners to repent and believe on Jesus Christ. So I write a little booklet called the Unabridged Gospel. And according to this law, they could actually make me an offender for my words. Uh, this law is like a snare. Well, to snare me, basically, and trap me. And I'm not just worried about it for me. I mean, I mean for all preachers throughout our state. It's a snare, my friends. And we had better be, be watchful here and not be a stupid bird that goes into the cage for a little nibble and end up with the door closing behind us and we're caught. All right? Even a bird's got enough sense not to walk into a trap like that. Uh, let's at least have the sense of a bird brain and be careful here. We've got a problem developing right here. We need to address it. And that's really the great concern here. Not that these other things aren't concerns. Of course, they're, they're deeply concerning to me that a homosexual man can't go find the help he wants. That's absurd. It's ridiculous. Or that, that me or anybody else can't engage in conversation that has as its intent and purpose to help a homosexual who has presented himself to us for help. It's, it's absolutely insane that they would do that. But it gets past that even. They're getting, they're laying a snare for ministers of the gospel. That's what they're doing. They're trying to make a man an offender for a word. This is a trap. We need to watch out for it. Uh, we think that there is an intention to apply this to pastoral counseling. All right? Now, let me, don't be fooled by this. They might make some kind of exception for pastors right now and all that kind of stuff. Please understand me when I tell you this. That is nonsense. Pastors don't have some kind of special permission to counsel somebody in, in sex change therapy that other people don't have. There's not some special rights for the pastors any more than there are any special rights for homosexuals or special rights for anybody else. Don't fall into that trap. That's just a little something to get you in the cage. No, we need to oppose this on, on its merits because it doesn't have any. But we do believe that they want to finally apply this to pastoral counseling scenarios where a homosexual comes to us for help with the things that they struggle with. And we think it's a first step toward making it unlawful for preachers to even make statements from their pulpits against the practice of homosexuality. And, uh, or in our publications, as I mentioned earlier, uh, or in the practice of our ministries. If we're out knocking on doors, we come across a homosexual, we engage in conversation. They say, you know, I hate this lifestyle. I wish there was a way out. I wish I didn't have to live like this. And then we say, well, you know, there is a way out uh, through repentance and faith in Christ and building faith in the word of God. And there are some things you can do and so on. Well, they want to make us offenders. They want to uh, make us lawbreakers for that kind of thing. It's a very clear, unmitigated violation of our First Amendment protections. All right, let's go ahead and proceed. We come to section number one. Now, I covered that in my last segment. I'm going to review it briefly. The first section 
basically offers an apology, and I don't mean by that an I'm sorry, I mean an argument defending the government's liberal majority opinion that homosexuals are not, they don't need any help. Okay, they've decided. If you're a homosexual and you want to change your orientation, uh, sorry, no, you don't, you're wrong. You don't need that help. And so you're not going to get it. Again, I, I get stuck on that because it, it's just so absolutely absurd. Anyway, <laughs> on the point here, uh, they declare flat out, quote, contemporary science recognizes that being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender is part of the natural spectrum of human identity and is not a disease, disorder, or illness, In quote. They just lay that out there as a, as a flat statement, and uh, there's no argument allowed. Uh, no, no room here for rebuttal, no place for further discussion. Well, the fact is, my friends, there are plenty of scientists and psychiatrists, by the way, who disagree with this. They disagree with that conclusion. It's kind of like this climate change nonsense. Uh, there are scientists on both sides with equal credentials here. Uh, this is not a, a done deal, all right? This is not uh, an argument about whether or not the Earth is spherical or flat. Okay, we have pictures from outer space that make it pretty clear uh, the Earth is spherical, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it's not an argument that has that kind of empirical evidence to support uh, either side of the conclusion, by the way. But uh, certainly, it, it doesn't support a conclusion that is so obviously contrary to what anybody can see is clear in nature. Anyway, more on that a little bit. Uh, nature, by the way, clearly disagrees with the conclusion of these so-called scientists. Uh, and I should mention, by the way, that the Bible disagrees with these scientists. And, of course, with those who accept Darwinian evolution or any other kind of uh, idea of evolution. So uh, the Bible is at odds with certain uh, elements of, of science in our society at present. It hasn't always been that way, but at present. And... Um, my friends, the Bible refers to the problem of science falsely so-called. That's interesting, isn't it? See, the Bible refers to something called science falsely so-called. True science is, is a friend to, well, truth, see. And the Bible certainly is never in contradiction with true science. I mean, real, verifiable, observable science. In any event, the Bible makes it clear that there is such a thing as science falsely so-called. And, and then there's real science. Real science is never uh, an enemy of truth, and therefore it's never in opposition to what the Bible says. Okay, so my friends, do you believe scientists are never wrong? Of course sometimes they're wrong. <laughs> All right? It's, it, that's a totally irrational assumption that because a scientist said it, therefore it must be true. Besides, the government doesn't get to decide what we believe about these things, even if they can make the claim that some scientists say it is true. Uh, look, science might be their Bible, but it's not mine. All right? It might provide the source of support for their ideology. It does not provide a source of support for my ideology, at least not the kind of science being, uh, being done today. Real science, no problem. Science falsely so-called, that's something else. My friend, in the same way that some folks use the Bible to support a doctrine that really, upon examination, is not supportable by the Bible, scientists sometimes use science to support a conclusion that isn't, upon further uh, study, actually supportable by science. Same thing happens on both sides of this whole thing. So we can't just knee-jerk accept their conclusions. The government does not get to decide for me that homosexuality is okay because science says so. There's the bottom line. The government does not get to decide for homosexuals whether or not they can seek counseling to overcome what their predilections incline them toward or a behavior they feel trapped in. The government doesn't have a right to, to do that. It just so happens that I believe the Bible speaks the truth to this issue. And the Bible says that it is unnatural. And I think the empirical evidence tells you that it's unnatural. I have an inalienable right to my opinion. And, and I have an inalienable right to express that opinion. Now, 
Let's look at one particular part of Section 1 that I did not address before. And let's look at it right now. Section 1 refers to a study that was conducted by the American Psychological Association. And most of you know the history of that. They were co-opted by the gay activist movement really some time back and literally threatened, cajoled, and bullied into removing homosexuality uh, from their list of psychological disorders and so on. But that's for another time. I just thought I'd bring it up right now so you understand where these people are coming from. The APA, as it's called, or referred to. Uh, they put together uh, a study that, uh, uh, from which they listed all of the potential harmful effects of sex change counseling, all right, or sex change therapy. Um, that list, when you look at it, is ridiculous. <laughs> I'll, I'll point this out to you more clearly in just a minute. But the APA has put together this list of things that what would, what would be called the possible side effects, negative side effects of sex change counseling. And the first thing I want to bring out about this is... Have you ever watched one of those commercials, you know, where they, they're talking to you about, I don't know, this or that drug that's going to help this or that problem? And then somewhere in there, uh, they kind of speed it up, and the guy gives a long, rapid list of all the things that could happen, right? All of the potential side effects. If you notice this or this or this or this or this or this or this, call your physician right away. If they don't stop using it, they get, right? So what's the point there? Well, there are quite a few side effects, very negative, some of them even including death, and some of these pills they allow to be advertised on the television and on radio and elsewhere. Do you know what I mean? If they're concerned about side effects, then they shouldn't allow, well, let's just get down to it. You understand that there are side effects for using aspirin, potential, possible side effects for anything that you do as far as a medical remedy is concerned, there are always side effects. So if we're going to prohibit a cure, a remedy, from being made available to somebody who seeks it because of side effects, well then these people, to be consistent, are going to have to make it illegal to offer a remedy to anybody for anything. In other words, my point is the absurdity of this, the inanity, the foolishness of this, how are we possibly taking this kind of thing seriously? You've got to be kidding me. Okay, so let's take a look at the potential side effects, according to APA, of sex change counseling. And you're going to notice two things as we go through this list. First thing, virtually every single one of the items in this list could be included in the list of the things that motivate the homosexual to come to us for help in the first place. That's right. Every one of these problems they list as possible side effects to sex change counseling are already present in the lives of these people before they come to us for any help. The second thing you'll notice is that, as a matter of fact, most of these things could be said to be possible side effects of doing, well, anything. Not all of them, but most of them. Most of the things they add to this list are things that would be uh, the potential side effects of living. I'm serious. You'll see that as we go through this list. It's just absurd. And the point I'm making there is it's obvious that they threw every single thing they could into that list because they wanted to create a kind of overwhelming sense of, oh, my God, don't do that. Look what will happen. But if you stop and think, you'll realize, wait a minute. <laughs> Half of those things are the side effect that I experienced from my job. <laughs> and so on. But we'll get into that some more as we go. Here's the first one. The first one, confusion. Oh, my. Really? You're going to start there? I mean, beside the obvious ridiculous irony that one presents, the fact is many homosexuals do experience intense confusion and conflict within themselves. And it arises from engagement in that behavior, compromising their, their conscience and, 
and distorting their intuitive sense, it's, it's very conflicting for them, especially at first. Now, over time, they can, what the Bible calls, sear their conscience so that that conscience God planted in them no longer operates and functions like it's designed to, like it's designed to function. And so they kind of harden themselves and, and get past much of that. But the fact is, in the early stages especially, this is a huge problem. And it continues on in some measure, depending on the personality and some other things. The next item in the list is depression. You know what? That's often what brings them in. That is often what brings them in. It's a huge problem in the homosexual community. But it's, of course, it's a problem throughout society. Admittedly, however, it's an intense problem in the homosexual community. And as we proceed, you'll appreciate why so many homosexuals struggle with deep and ongoing depression. Guilt, yeah, right. Another presenter. This very often is what is nagging at them and poking at them and that finally brings them to one of us, a pastor or something like that, to offer them some counseling to help them overcome this thing. Helplessness, hopelessness, shame. Yes, sirree. All of these things are usually part of why some homosexuals, not all, of course, but why some homosexuals come to us for help. And then social withdrawal. Yeah, the homosexual community is a pretty lonely one, let me tell you. And it continues to be fairly isolated from the main population, even now, after all the efforts they've made contrary-wise. You see, the behavior simply does not mix well in the main population. It just doesn't. Uh, even where it's tried, it just, it just doesn't. Even in cultures where it's widely accepted or understood that it goes on, I should say, really not accepted, but understood that it goes on. You know, for example, I recently did some research uh, and learned that in the Muslim community, in certain areas, not throughout all Muslims throughout the world, but in some significant numbers of these Muslim communities over in Afghanistan and elsewhere in the Middle East, um, the homosexuality, a sodomy between man and man is, is really common and accepted and not really frowned upon unless the secret gets out. That's bizarre, isn't it? If you're caught or if it gets out into the open, then it's a huge problem. Why? Because they're ashamed of it. It's just weird. Uh, more on that another time. The bottom line is that homosexual behavior is unnatural. All right? And as most things unnatural, it is instinctively rejected by the main body. It just is. It's a normal thing. Uh, the behavior is aberrant and to most persons abhorrent. It just is. Now, many will hide their natural revulsion because of the pressure of political correctness, quite frankly, uh, because of government-enforced and culturally promoted um, political correctness it has intimidated many people to hide their true feelings about this behavior. <laughs> So it's really ironic, isn't it? While the homosexual is being encouraged to feel good about his homosexuality and to embrace it and to accept it as just part of their identity, uh, those of us who have a, a different identity, curiously, those of us who have um, an aversion to it, which is part of our identity, those of us who reject that behavior as certainly counterintuitive to the propagation of the species. I mean, it doesn't even make Darwinian sense. It, <laughs> it certainly makes no biblical sense, but it doesn't even make Darwinian sense. Uh, there's, anyway, I'm supposed to suppress my natural, instinctive, personal identity while they are encouraged to embrace what they're trying to tell us is their natural and instinctive personal identity. And I'm sorry, my friend. That's just not going to happen. And you, can, you can make laws and cajole people and bully people into not saying this or into saying that, but you're not going to change the fundamental programming of our DNA. It isn't going to happen. 
So anyway, the suicide rate is a huge problem um, in, among homosexuals. And this one probably bothers me more than any of the others. I mean, they, they call it suicidality or suicidality, however you pronounce it. It's, it's psychological jargon for those who are vulnerable to suicidal tendencies. And indeed, the suicide rate has always been very high among homosexuals. I read in one place the stats are fairly consistent that uh, 50% of suicides can be attributed to homosexuals. That's, a, that's bizarre. I mean, that's over-the-top outrageous when you consider that they only represent 2% or at the most 4% of the general population. It's unbelievable. Suicide is huge, a huge problem. Now, of course, they try to blame it on everybody else, but it doesn't come from everybody else. It comes from their own inner demons. Multiple studies conform very closely to the conclusion that teens who exhibit gender confusion early on are the more likely to attempt suicide than their peers. Uh, suicide's a huge problem in the homosexual community, and it is among the most important reasons that anybody who wants to come out of that obsessive and destructive lifestyle should be given the help they're asking for. All right, substance abuse. You've got to be kidding me. And again, in my, what I'm saying, you got to be kidding me, is that's a reason to help them. It's because that's true. Substance abuse is rampant in the homosexual community. Here's some, here's some facts for you, right? Here's a study that finds 25 to 33% of homosexuals and lesbians are alcoholics. Now, I would include lesbians in the term homosexual, but it doesn't matter. In any event, homosexuals, 25 to 33% of that community are alcoholics. Now, when you consider this, you need to understand that over the overall percentage of alcoholics to the general population in America is only like 12.5%. It's one in eight, all right? In their community, it's one in four. I want you to consider that. And then when you look at the number of the general community, the general population, that includes the suicides that occur within the homosexual population. So it's even worse than that. You know, the, the homosexual community is more than twice as likely to commit suicide than the heterosexual community. Another study finds that sexual minorities have higher rates of substance misuse and abuse, something they call SUDs or SUDs, substance use disorders than people who identify as heterosexual. And then here's another study. Um, it says LGBT persons also have a greater likelihood than non-LGBT LGBT persons of experiencing a substance use disorder, SUD, uh, in their lifetime. And they often enter into treatment with more severe SUDs. Now, happily, it, says, it also says some common SUD treatment modalities have been shown to be effective for gay and bisexual men, including motivational interviewing, social support therapy, contingency management, and cognitive behavioral therapy, yada, yada. But my point here is, okay, so why can't they get help when they ask for it to exit the homosexual lifestyle? Why can't they have that help? Now, here you go. Stress. Yeah, they included stress. They got to throw it all in there, you see. They try to make the list as long as they can make it. Stress, a potential side effect of sex change counseling. Good night. My friend, stress is a side effect of any counseling, very particularly marriage counseling and parenting counseling and whatever other kind of counseling you can think of. You got to be kidding me. <laughs> My point there is that they've thrown everything they can in here to inflate this list and to make it overwhelming. Disappointment is added. Disappointment. Yeah, be kidding me. Self-blame, decreased self-esteem, self, -esteem, self uh, or, or decreased authentic sense of authenticity. All these things, all these things, my friends, are potential side effects to living. Increased self-hatred, hostility, blame toward parents, feelings of anger and betrayal, loss of friends or romantic partners, problems of sexual and emotional intimacy, even high-risk sexual behaviors are, is, is listed here. So homosexual goes to a a counselor to get help so they, they can come out of the homosexual lifestyle. And that is the reason that they are now going to engage in a more high-risk sexual behaviors. It's nonsense. 
It's just absolute nonsense. Almost all of these things could be included in a list of potential side effects to things like skateboarding, race car driving, skydiving, or engaging in recitals. That's a tough one. Boy, that's a high stress. How about failing at a baseball tryout and so on? There's a reason I'm bringing these up. I don't have time to go into. This is the most unscientific and the most unreasonable bunch of nonsense that I can imagine. And yet, serious people who are in a serious position to seriously mess up this state are taking this nonsense seriously. But consider the fundamentally flawed thinking here as we begin to close this segment. If the government is going to withhold treatment from someone, if they're going to make it unlawful to seek or provide such treatment based on the potential side effects of that treatment, as I said earlier, they're going to have to declare it illegal to offer treatment to anyone for anything. My point is, this is bogus. This is nothing but nonsense. That's all it is. Okay. So this is the longest segment in the series, by the way. So don't despair to go to the next one. Uh, but we will move on to the next section of this bill where they offer a definition of their terms. And this is where it gets particularly concerning. All right, my friends, email me. Go to our website, brainmassage.net, or go to our church website, santamarialighthouse.org, either one. But if you go to either of those, you'll find a place where you can send me an email. And I'd love to hear from you. We have a little place where you put lights on if you agree with what I'm saying, lights off if you disagree. If you want to qualify, you can hit one of them and then explain in your email. Some people do that. They'll, they'll put lights off and then they'll say, however, there are some times when I think you're brilliant. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, I'm remembering a specific one recently. And, uh, or you can go in there and hit lights on and you could qualify and say, you know, but sometimes I think you're an absolute idiot. That'd be okay too. <laughs> or you could ignore lights on or lights off and just send me a, a, look, I've given you a piece of my mind to chew on. Go ahead and throw down a chunk of your own mind that, that I can chew on. If you can afford to lose anyone, anyway, I'm just kidding around. All right. Send me a letter. Let me know what you think about these things. Let me know what you think about our efforts here. Let, you, let me know what you think about our show, the Brain Massage Show, and all that kind of stuff. Love to hear from you. And um, listen, God bless you, and God bless America. And I'll see you in church. <laughs>